kind of got confused. <laughs> okay, well, good, because I, I don't know what to say. So, <laughs> um, so hi, everyone. As you can see, um, Robert is not here, and I am pitching in, and Victoria is getting married this weekend. So send good vibes if that's your thing. Um, we are going to have um, guest speaker Ryan, but before we do that, um, Sabrina wanted to share an announcement, and then when Ryan is done, I can um, share a little bit about the work that I'm doing, or Ryan, Ryan, if you want me to start with that and then you do your thing, that's fine also, but um, we're just kind of in here connecting, and if we have any of our new folks here who want to say hello and um, let us know a little bit, like like a little bit about <laughs> yourself and what brought you to Elevate. That would be, this is a great time to do that now. Oh, we lost P312237 or whatever. <laughs> that was. Um, so do we have any? I know Aisha, I remember you on the last call and Diane, you've been on the last few calls. Diana, I'm not sure if this is your first call. I, I know I jumped on late last time. I'll introduce myself and I'm, I apologize if you hear Daniel Tiger in the background. That's because my coworker <laughs> insists, insists um, on, on having that show um, uh, on repeat. So in any case, uh, but my name is Aisha Parker, really excited about um, being a part of this collective. And um, my, uh, my interest, I think you said, in terms of joining um, Elevate um, is my um, niche as a, as a coach is, is social impact. So really helping folks that um, wanna do a lot of good, you know, in, in good ways, um, uh, just, you know, kind of boil down on what's the best ways to um, uh, manifest or, or apply their time, talent, and treasure to, to making that happen. So. That's um that's kind of my 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 shtick. My niche actually one of my specialties is actually in working with um young leaders, young people um that are looking to get involved in civic engagement, um, et cetera. I professionally have worked um in uh the nonprofit sector specifically with children, um in uh in therapeutic settings, foster care, kids in social services, and you know, it's just been uh, a part of my inspiration that indigenous voices, folks that are most impacted, um, especially by the, the social service uh, structure that we have in the United States, really need to be more involved in policymaking and, um, and driving the agenda of what that's going to look like in the future. So that's kind of my specialty, again, is working with um, young change makers for social impact. So that's a little bit about me. I've got a four-year-old coworker, just three others that are in their last day of school um, and might be coming in, in, in during this meeting, but I'm really excited and happy to be here and thank you for welcoming me. Yeah, well, we're happy to have you and looking forward to seeing all the great impact you make with us at Elevate. Um, we, oh, it looks like we also lost Diana, so we'll keep moving forward. <laughs> um, Sabrina, do you want to make your announcement? Well, yes, I'd like to know what Aisha is paying this four-year-old um, as a co-worker, because um, I wouldn't mind staying home and watching Daniel's Tiger, because I've seen that show frequently myself. It's goldfish. <laughs> I pay in goldfish, which is pretty oh. much all that I can afford. I well, all the rest of that she hits me up with. So yes, the payment right. is goldfish. Okay, well, that works too, because I do like, um, oh, and Crystal pays in mac and cheese. Okay, Aisha, you're out. I'll go over to Crystal's <laughs> and work for her. Thank you. <laughs> I just so. think it's fascinating that you guys, like, I actually um, am the um, subordinate in the home. Uh, my cat is my supervisor and um, he pays me <laughs> in cuddles oh. and allowing me to use the space. Oh, well, well, very good. Exactly. <laughs> I hope that you feel honored and treasured in that way. Sandra like fair wages know. for fair work that's what that sounds like <laughs> <laughs> I love it I love it um so I just and wanted to do a, a quick announcement I had mentioned in our meeting last week that um I would be leading the DEI efforts and strategy for 
elevate. And when I say leading, that's really loosely. It's just more of coordinating and rallying more so the voices at the table. Um, so I did mention that I would be, you know, putting together our first meeting. So um, look out for some emails from me either this afternoon. I was able to, to grab your emails from Victoria before she, she abandoned us for marriage. I mean, who does that? No, I'm kidding. But while she's off, so I was able to get that information. So I'll send out a couple of potential dates um, for those of you all that did sign up to be a part um, so that we can meet as a collective um, outside of this time frame. Initially, I was going to try to bargain with Robert to use the same time and maybe in a rotation. But I think it's probably better to look at having a different point in the week because I know he wants to use this time specifically for us to do what we're doing today and other things. So just look out for that. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you, Sandra. Thank you. All right, Ryan, are you ready? Sure. I'm feeling the gentle nudge that you want me to go first, so. Um, I feel like you have more to say than I do, honestly. That's the real thing. <laughs> Well, I have nothing planned, but I, I do I do freestyle a lot uh, in a couple of different regards. So I'll just go from there. And also, Aisha kind of led into a beautiful segue about what I'll share about um, the medium length story about my experience in, in case those who haven't heard it and then how that's kind of the contextual alignment of how I end up doing the work that I do now. But um, grew up north of Boston and basically uh, when I was 20 years old, realized that I was doing something, playing baseball, Division One baseball, that I didn't want to do. I really wanted to go and discover the world. So I moved to Hong Kong when I was 20 years old and started studying Chinese philosophy. And basically from that point, I realized that the world was a very large place that I had seen uh, close to none of. And I then moved to Spain to finish all of my university um, courses and then was brought to Cameroon uh, into a farming village named Bali Nyonga, close to the border of Nigeria when I was 22, uh, by a social entrepreneurship professor who was looking for three or four students who were studying social entrepreneurship to go in and work and learn from the farming confederations why 40 to 50% of the food was going to waste. So I lived in this farming village when I was 22 for almost a year and that completely like revolutionized and transformed my entire life. <clears throat> um, and from that point forward, I realized that my efforts, I wanted to allocate towards benefiting people, planet, what Buddhism calls all sentient beings essentially. And that that's the entire point of my skin and this, and this costume uh, that I wear is to actually utilize my privilege to reverse the causes of, of what, or to, to reverse the, the things that caused it in the world systemically. Like that's the entire point of why I am who I am. Um, and then throughout the remaining next 10 years, I traveled around the world, li living and sitting with indigenous elders, uh, uh, learning from them, and then looking to apply those philosophies into business models that created regeneration in communities. So I moved to Myanmar and was bringing in Gandhian economic Swadeshi, like preventing rapid urbanization, <clears throat> which creates loss of culture and loss of all of the things that come with that by bringing microgrid solar out to create intra-village relationships and then restoring mangrove forests and basically doing like business models like this, helping local tourism companies in Ghana to fund uh, grassroots development projects in the country as opposed to like siphoning the money out to like Chinese joint venture owned things and like basically I've just been doing this for like 10 or 11 years simultaneously learning how to grow food and sitting with traditional indigenous elders from the Larakia aboriginal people in Australia where I lived for a while to the Mashika uh, known as the Aztec people in Mexico but they're actually an active speaking culture of Nahuatl the ancient Aztec people are actually still alive now the Clinket people in Alaska, and I've just kind of bounced around. And now what I do is I integrate what I've learned through culture, which relates directly to DEI is the fact that for me, when I've learned about culture and I've sat with these different cultures, the word culture and cultivation come from the same word. So essentially every single traditional indigenous culture 
that all of us have some sort of blood within that we've been kind of wiped out in this mechanized pseudo culture that's swept across the world. All of it is related to social geography that the culture stems from the land. So for me to approach DEI, and this is just from where I'm sitting, to approach DEI without actually being able to approach the land and sustainability is missing the point of where culture comes from. Um, and we can't actually operate in a, in, a, in a way that is diverse, equitable, and inclusive without simultaneously cultivating the diverse equity and inclusion of the environments that created the culture. Um, so this is where I kind of work to bring sustainability or what I call ESG 2.0 in is by integrating things that often are forgotten within the DEI space because it's focused on human centricity, which is really, really important, but simultaneously humans don't exist without the environment. That's like part of the, that's part of the, the shtick being human. It's like, you've got to drink water, you've got to eat food, you've got to breathe air. We all die, you know? So bringing in this understanding that there is no binary between human and nature. There is no binary between business and planet. For me, this like helps uh, to orient myself where like, actually, if we're, if we're benefiting the traditional cultures of the world and trying to make it an equitable place, the majority of the systemically oppressed places in the world are because of resource extraction in the first place. So the land is being extracted in the same way that the people are then being extracted from. And if we're looking at these mirrors, then how do we actually begin to stop the extraction process on one level? and build in regenerative processes, which then naturally will bring other people into that space. Because the human life, if the land is being treated in a regenerative way, actually is, is doing really well. Um, and that regeneration is a very broad use term. It's already been co-opted by Nestle and a few other companies. <laughs> uh, there's no way that Nestle can be regenerative. That's absolutely insane. Um, but basically for me, regeneration, simultaneously stems into health and wellness and this is what we see like purpose is being a big thing that's coming up now and i think that organizations are really still struggling because how can how can the organization have a direct line of what they think their purpose is and then fit each individual's instrument into that harmony that the organization flows into I, and i don't think that organizations have figured out how to do that like if if everyone's purpose here is something that is not specific to the organization's purpose, how do you cultivate that space within people and the organization to hold those people actually pursuing their purpose? Um, I also think that purpose isn't something that you find. I think that this, this is actually one of the TED Talks that I'm, I'm, I'm applying to speak for is actually why you'll never find your purpose. I think that it's something that most people think that they're going to find like they're going to find their car keys or something You're like oh my purpose was right there all along i had no idea it's like the the purpose is coming from a place that we're seeking it from so i some of you may have heard the quote what you're seeking is seeking you i believe it's jaludin rumi who said that so really that's the way that i view purpose is that the your purpose is the exact being who is seeking the purpose and for you to actually live into what that means to be you, you need to live into the fact of what makes you you, which part of that is being a human. So purpose, I also find, is directly interrelated with sustainability and with the earth. That's what humans have been doing for tens of thousands, if not more years, is uh, living in right relation. Uh, the Lakota people say, Mataki in all, all my relations. And we often forget that our relations and our relatives are not only human. And how do we build systems around getting back in right relationship with all of our relatives? You know. So this is kind of this is kind of the work that I do. Um, and I'll stop there because that was a lot of information that I just dropped. Maybe some nonlinear paths as well to get there. And see, so yeah, I'll just kind of open it up for any questions or because it's just an open talk. Yeah. I actually have a comment, but Aisha, were you about to say something? Oh, I thought you were raising your hand. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, I, I appreciate the um, the connection you're making with um, structural. Well, in my like studying on it, it was just referred to as structural racism because of kind of the way like you can 
uh, look at different, like if you plot out a neighborhood, for example, or a community, um, you by race, you like you can see that um, a lot of neighborhoods are segregated. Um, and then based on the segregation of the neighborhoods, you'll know, you can kind of guess how many um, fresh fruit uh, vendors would be in the area or, you know, how the distance a person would have to go to get um, uh, cigarettes versus uh, an apple. Like you can plot that also by race um, in a neighborhood. And so I definitely think that the um, environmental social justice movement doesn't get enough attention. Um, but I also think that part of that has to do with, um, because it's literally by design, uh, yeah. that there are uh, imperatives that people are, are keeping in place. Now, it might not just be based on race. It could be based on a lot of things, especially as our society continues to evolve. And that also doesn't take it, that's a lot of urban planning that happens. It doesn't take into account people living in rural areas. And of course, I'm focusing specifically on domestic diversity here in the United States. Um, because there's also um, some things to be said about healthy food options in rural communities um, that are more or less available. When I moved from Florida to Indiana, it, like, it took me an hour to find a Whole Foods, and I wasn't even in the rural part of Indiana. And for probably a year and a half, I would drive that hour to Whole Foods or Trader Joe's, and then over time, it seemed like it was less worth it, so I would just go to the Kroger and settle on the fact that I had less options if I wanted to have um, food free of pesticides or da 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 da, da. So it's definitely um, a topic that needs a lot more attention and I um, appreciate your passion for it, for sure. Yeah, yeah, and, and it's actually part of what I, I look to connect businesses with is like, if you're operating in a place, let's say they're operating in Indiana, and you're not actually re-stimulating the economy that your business is working in, like you're degenerating that entire state. And how do you regenerate it? Like part, the really big part is food systems, because food, like you're saying, is is actually part of the design of systemic oppression. Like when I, when I was living on the west side of Oahu on in Waianae. Um, that's basically where a lot of the traditional Hawaiians got like gentrified out into. And I was, I was living there on a farm learning how to, 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 to work with the Aina from some of the Hawaiian people. And you would go to the grocery store and it was all cans and all frozen foods and all of these things. And like from my studies of Ayurvedic medicine, when I was living in India, like there's, there's three classifications of food. There's sattvic tamasic and rajasic and tamasic foods which are frozen and canned and all these foods that are literally like dead because they've been like the life force has been like like halted it's simultaneously you are what you eat right so like when you embody those things you actually are unable to think and function in a in, in a way that is going to like motivate and inspire you out of the situation that was put upon you so like food systems for me, it's like, it's just, it's a really big part. Um, and I think that that's, I think it's, I should be mandatory for every single business. Like when I was driving through Jackson, Mississippi too, I was wondering, it was like, I stopped at this really good restaurant and was t talking with the people there and they've been there for like 40, 50 years. And just seeing that, that town, like, it's like a wave of business came in and then it's just like gone. And it just feels it feels so, like there, there's so much space for that for that community or existing businesses to like invest like a small portion of the money that they make into like regenerating local food systems because then the entire community will be built up around it in like a beautiful way and that's part of like the the orientation that i'm going to that i'm moving with businesses is like well that actually will pay back into your business because like retention, blah, blah, like all these things that we talk about, right? It's like, yeah. plus you're actually stimulating more life in the world. And like not every single component of your business needs to be paid back on a material monetary realm. Like we're still stuck in the seen realms. We forget that like every single part of a physical reality is informed from an unseen place. Mm -hmm. And that's something more, that's more shamanic. That's more going into this like traditional way of viewing, which I've also been brought into, but like 
there's a reason why you put flower offerings on a river you know it's not that the river is like thank you so much it's like <laughs> but like how do you how do you create beauty in the world you know mm. and we're a human family you know so it's part of this sort of thing that um yeah diane um, Ryan, there's a TED talk you may find interesting. Um, it was done here in Boston. Um, and it was, the idea was this person was trying to plant apple seeds and I mean, in apple trees. So the whole idea was that if you needed fruit, you could have it in, you know, in, in public space. So they were, they were, they had this whole apple initiative to plant these trees in, um, on public lands that were open um so that people could actually just go out and like grab the fruit it was a pretty interesting um conversation yeah i wonder who was cultivating and caring for the trees while they were growing and then simultaneously what's stopping someone who's still greedy from going and taking all the apples you know and then selling them exactly. <laughs> but so, but no like it's but even i shook my head because i assumed there was going to be some um like some person who came and you can't do that because a lot of the the and this borders on the the verge of conspiracy theories, but it's like certain industries control our cap capitalistic society, and one of them is the healthcare industry. And keeping people sick is a lot more profitable than keeping them healthy. And so, a lot of these things that are going on with the food systems create dizzy, like how you were talking about eating dead food or eating animals that are pumped full of hormones and pesticides and all these things, well, it gets you sick, but then you go to the doctor and you pay for a prescription and you get well enough to eat more of these things that keep you sick. It's just very um, unfortunate. Is when you were saying that, Diane, I thought of grow when I was growing up, there were apricot trees. We did run through the neighborhood and just grab fruit off the tree. My uh, grandma, I'm, you know, I'm Southern, so we say pecan. So we had a pecan tree in my grandma's yard and we would go out and uh, part, we, she would give us, you know, 25 cents, whoever pulled out the most um, pecans. And, uh, and then she would use them to make pecan pies and, you know, share them or whatever, if it was for family, but it didn't matter. But it was like, food, free, healthy, organic food <laughs> was readily available uh, in a way that just does not seem um, to be the same. But sorry, Aisha, you have your hand up and then back to Diane. No, 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 thank you, thank you. Um, I know, I, first off, uh, Ryan, just really appreciate your, um, your perspective. It's funny because right now I'm reading a lot of uh, Gurdjieff and, and Adler. And so the things that you're talking about in terms of just like, you know, purpose and whether or not that's even a thing, like that's a much bigger conversation. So I'd love to talk to you um, offline about all of that. But it just got me thinking about um, what you're describing really sounds to me almost like a re-education, right? I, I believe that edu the point of education is self-reliance, right? And a lot of these indigenous cultures have an, an awareness and an understanding about the land that quite frankly, isn't shared by the commercial sector, right? Folks, indigenous you know, cultures know when to plant something and why you plant something next to something else and why you only do this at a certain time of year or why you don't do this. And things that just don't translate, um, you know, in, ter in terms of understanding by the commercial sector and arguably, arguably, um, it's not in their best interest <laughs> because if you're self-reliant, right, then why would you buy something from me? But that's a whole nother story. So I guess where I'm trying to get at is I wonder if you could speak to what is the role then or how are you how do you go about like educating essentially educating these these commercial enterprises on this kind of ancient knowledge that the communities that they're you know kind of uh, uh impacting you know have known for for, for so long like I, I definitely appreciate like the restorative you know kind of practices but then there's so much knowledge right that already exists that doesn't have to be recreated it just has to be learned by a different population and just how are you getting that buy-in um to happen if, if at all if that's even a part of the agenda yeah it definitely is a part of 
the agenda and it's it's taken me about it's pretty quick actually i guess like like eight eight to ten months to like attempt to condense this amount of like knowledge into something that's like i can hand off and be like yeah this is this is will apply to your business right i call it the regenerative leadership academy it's part of the learning and development thing that i've that i've created specifically for businesses um but then i have i have another initiative that that i'm i'm in the process of migrating into called future elders um which actually brings people into this sort of understanding because a lot of a lot of the people that I, I talk with are really obsessed with like metrics and quantitative approaches. And it's like, well, if we, if we just get rid of carbon emissions, then like, it'll be good. And it's like, well, I don't think so. <laughs> you know, like, I'm going to have to disagree with you. Uh, <laughs> and there, and the mind, like we've become kind of what you're saying, like there, there's a seasonality of intelligence that traditional communities have. And mechanization, when I said the pseudo culture of mechanization, it, that means that like we're in an infinite summer and we're like trapped in this GDP model of growth and like something that continually grows based on the unwillingness to recognize the source of its own growth is a tumor. Because if it's separate enough from itself that it continues to grow, that's how cancer forms. So I call myself one of the first personal degrowth coaches in the world because everyone's obsessed with growth and development. And it's, we actually need degrowth and decomposition because that's how you find purpose. That's how you find wisdom. That's not how you find, like you, if, if we can read audiobooks at 1.6 X and try to like pump as much knowledge in ourselves like Tim Ferriss. And it's like, that's not where it's going because that's only gonna confuse us more the more information that we have. Uh, if, I think it's Aljuis Huxley versus George Orwell with Brave New World in 1984. Aljuis Huxley said the issue isn't gonna be um, an absence or a tucking away of information, it's going to be so much information that it all becomes irrelevant because there's just a sea of confusion that ends up happening that people don't know what is what and who is who. And in the Bible, Babylon, you know, Babylon is this, is this society that is essentially like big and grand and everything's convenient and there's the hanging gardens and there's blah, blah, blah. And in Babylon, I was sitting with an Aramaic scholar, this like 95 year old dude in Boston, house full of dusty books and like old drum kits. And I was like, I was like, do you listen to reggae? And he's like, no, I don't listen to, don't listen to reggae. I listen to like jazz. And I'm like, but in reggae, they sing a lot about Babylon. Like, can you tell me about what do they say about this in the Bible? And he's like, he's like, oh, Babylon comes from the root word Balal, which means to confuse. I was like, oh, so it's like, it's about confusion. It's about, there's, there's so much information that people are confused. You go to a grocery store, there's 10 jams. How are you going to pick which jam to eat on your peanut butter and jelly? It's like, <laughs> there's, just, there, there's so much that we have a hard time sorting through it. And there's been no, the mind can't find it, right? Like it can only be found through a place that isn't corrupted by desire, which is the heart. So this is also the re-education or the reorientation is, how do we begin to listen again? Because you find purpose through listening and you don't, and the mind just is kind of runs off on its own. But if you can reorient yourself to listen and then create, as they say in, in Hinduism, the, the mind is a, a lousy master, but a really great servant. So uh, Diane and then Sabrina, and then we'll thanks. wrap up. <laughs> Go ahead. All right. So Ryan, I'm going to throw you a curveball here. I think that you could do something with your baseball food and all of this sort of stuff and loop it together. If I, 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 I have a column in my head, if I was Eminem, Melinda Gates or Mackenzie Bezos, what would I do with my money? <laughs> I would love to reinvent the education system, starting with food and kindergartners. And the kindergartners would split the would count would say who likes green apples and who likes red apples or who's allergic to apples, and they would bring that in there. And the third graders would supervise the kindergartners. And then as you go up the up the food chain in the in the class, you know, in the in the school, you get more and more sophisticated. So by the time you're a senior in high school, you're running the school cafeteria, you know how to manage people, you know supply chain, you know overage, you know spoilage you know, all of that. 
if you could do a gamification of that with your baseball, I think you would have a home run. I'm, I'm having kind of fun how I'm thinking about this, yeah, frankly. I see that. <laughs> and um, I mean, I teach people how to watch American football. Why? If you can't speak sports, you can't network. I got, I got this workshop on CBS News. And so I think if you'd want to, and I, I would, I hope you can take this in the spirit it's intended. So I, you're very, very pure and, um, and um, with your information that what, I don't wanna say you need to dumb it down, but I think you, if you can take it to a business case, you could do really, really well as a speaker. And if you could speak to people where they are, I humbly don't think this is a diversity topic. I think it's bigger. And I think if you are able to take this up a notch and make it a little bit of fun and, you know, grab a Nerf ball so no one gets hurt, you know, I mean, I have little, um, what are those, you know, squeeze things in the shape of brains and I hand them out and I'm like, it's time for a brainstorm. You, you know, I toss them in the air. You know, I think if you can have a little bit of fun with this, lighten this up, this is a very heavy topic. I used to work for Earthwatch. I understand, you know, the impact of the environment. Um, I mean, I know, you know, for every African girl you educate beyond the fifth grade, you, um, you, uh, you um, stop 500 births, you know? So when, when women are educated, they don't start having babies at 14 and those babies have at 14 and those with is educating women, you know? And so um, if you could bring some of these topics in so that they're positive, I don't wanna make, 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 assume they're not light or that they're not important. But if we can have, if, if I would love to see a group of little kids, how quickly would they organize a cafeteria? I mean, it, when I'm, I'm a, I used to be on the board of the Association of Tra Training and Development. It was hysterical. Those of us who'd been school teachers of fifth graders, it was easier to get the fifth graders to do an, an exercise than it was adults who all wanted to argue about why you should be doing it this way and this way different. They would over-exercise it. So take it, make it simple, make it a game and say, here's how we can win. I, I recycle, I do as much as I can. And every so often when I feel like I'm not doing enough, I said, here's the one thing I've done for the environment. I've had no children. I have, think about the diapers I've saved. Think about the toys, think about the gas. Think about, I mean, you know, so part of it is, I'm not saying don't have kids. I'm just saying, finding a way to make this a, yes, I can, instead of a shame on you. I think that that would be very well heard and you could, you know, and if you bring it into the business case, I mean, and, and when I mentioned this idea of getting the kids to do the cafeteria, someone said to me, the reason why it will never happen is because of the lobbying of people who want to control the food chain. So start with the, you know, start where you can. Anyhow, that's my two cents. I think Ryan, you could have a lot of fun if you would want to have a little bit of a, you know, a game of with that and, and make that happen. So that's my two cents. Cool. Yeah, thank you for sharing. Sabrina. Hi, everybody. Um, I just, you know, thank you so much, Ryan, for that breakdown, because I think I've heard bits and pieces of your story, but not necessarily. I'm just glad that I heard the whole story, because, you know, a lot of times when you don't hear the whole story, you fill in the gaps with what you know, which in my case is limited. But what I'll say is that um, the first thought for me was wow to get Ryan and Frank together on a stage because <laughs> I can't help because Frank is a chef I mean he's done many other things but lately obviously we've been seeing a lot of his you know uh, promoting his cookbook and things of that sort but I think what's unique for me what I kept hearing in in all of the messaging today is you know Elevate is a unique place when would you get all of these interesting different minds in one place to be able to provide offerings to businesses. And I think that's what we can uniquely um, promote is these intersections that wouldn't normally intersect. So I just think in, in thinking about not only as we promote ourselves and the various specialties and, and, and topics that we have on our own, but how can we intersect it? 
together in a different way. So I'd like to see more brainstorming sessions like this of how we can put something together in a unique way and package it for you know clients as they come in looking for those interesting motivational topics and obviously ultimately ways to change people's thinking so that we can have ultimately a better world that we live in. So that's all I wanted to say, thanks. Ryan, any final thoughts or response to Sabrina? Um, no, I just appreciate everyone sharing and listening. I kind of like went off on like a little, a little ramble. <laughs> I've been I've been leading these group calls with people who have started to take the the course Future Elders, and so sometimes I just like get a hit of information and then just like go with it. Um, but I do I I think that there, everything that Diane, what you were sharing was was useful because a, a lot of people, there's like a paralysis that occurs where it's like, whoa, like I'm trying to figure out how to not react to my partner in relationship. How am I going to like fix that, you know? And it's like, there can be this thing. So to make it light is and, and, and simplify, you said dumb it down. That's actually... I mean, Jay Z has a line, you know. He's he's like, I had to dumb down my lyrics to double my dollars. That's one of his lines, you know. So, so I think comedy is responsible for twenty five percent of NBC's revenue. Yeah, and so, there are a lot of to that point. There are a lot of you know smart comedians, and they're the most popular ones. People love going to listen to Dave Chappelle because they enjoy the things they learn while they laugh. Um, but anyway, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to cut you off, Diane. No, no. I mean, Randy Rainbow is hysterical. If you ever want to watch any of the Randy Rainbow, um, videos, it's just absolutely hysterical. Let me but, just ask um, Ryan a, a, a question before we run out of time. Diane, if you don't mind if I... No, go ahead. I, I'm done. I'm done. So, so, Ryan, how... I, From everything that you've said, you've done a lot of traditional farming and you've lived in you know, in India and in Hawaii. And have you ever compared all of the information that you've gathered from all those different cultures to the Mediterranean lifestyle? Have you ever done a comparison? Uh, yes. <laughs> and and then enlighten me on what your comparison was. Because when, when I go to Italy, where most people eat and live because... A Mediterranean, it's not a Mediterranean diet. It's a Mediterranean lifestyle, which means you shop for the healthiest foods. You use your own ingredients where you can. When you go around Italy, the majority of people have tomato plants out on their terraces. They have small, they have taken every little piece of earth that they can and they grow just their own food, even if it's just for <laughs> Sunday dinner, so to speak. So how would you incorporate the Mediterranean lifestyle into exactly what you're saying? Because it is very important. The people, folks out there that don't understand the Mediterranean lifestyle, don't understand where our food comes from. And that's why the earth is, is just diminishing down because People are eating potato chips instead of making, you know, beans that or making a tomato or something else like that. So, yeah, I'd love to hear what you have to say on that. I would say that that's not exclusively a Mediterranean lifestyle. That's just being human. Living on the earth. Yeah. Yes. But from I think to Frank's point, um, a lot of countries have uh, discouraged that lifestyle in a way that in the Mediterranean, because they, they live that way in Greece too, Correct. where but it's Greece, encouraged. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. I, I, I see where you're or, orienting this towards. Um, yeah, I think that there's a, there's a really cool book on something called the, the Blue Zones, where there's a, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. so you know about this, like basically yeah. there's more like uh, people, people who live over 200. Yeah. Well, one uh, of the reasons, like my cookbook is a Mediterranean cookbook. My grandfather lived to be 101. Why? Because he grew his own vegetables and he ate the majority of his own vegetables 
for six months out of the year during that part of the growing season. Yeah. Then in the winter in New York, you really can't grow your own vegetables. But then he stored and uh, preserved whatever he could to get him through the rest of the year. So yeah. in, in, well, in, that, in that aspect, and like in Greece and in other areas where they do do that, when you, you drive around Italy and you see high rise buildings, you will see vegetable plants growing off the buildings that people are eating and sustaining themselves. I don't see that in New York. Right. And I think that actually, for, just to add one more point, is that the food is one thing, but it's actually a connection to cultivating life that is yes. really, what, really what you get from doing those sort of activities. It's like my partner, my partner, Marissa, and I have a garden out here where we're growing a bunch of food. And if she's having a hard day, because she's a, she takes care of six children, five dogs and this entire family on this ranch that we live on. If she's having a hard day and she puts her hands in in the soil, evaporated. Like well, all have of you ever heard of grounding? Have you oh, ever yeah. Heard of grounding? Yeah. I was gonna say, like it's no people, most people can't tell. I, I tell people I'm like the, the best dressed hippie you'll ever meet. I, mm -hmm. I the same. <laughs> like I uh when I'm having a rough day, I go out and walk around barefoot and I know my neighbors are like, What is she doing? I literally hug trees. I talk to the trees in my yard. <laughs> Like, it's there. It does create a different kind of um, balance and connection. I, 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 just be, I would just be interested how we can correlate the two with all of that vast knowledge that you have on ancient societies and ways of farming and what it does, and then bring that in. Because to me, the most commonly known way of is the most people know of the mediterranean diet or they call it so how would you take that and encompass that into your regeneration of land and understanding that so that you could actually reach more people yeah you know with a sledgehammer of course because that's really what has to happen well it, right now I'm sorry, I don't want to speak for you, Ryan, but I just I'm very well versed on conspiracy theories, too. That And there is one that might answer Frank's question. <laughs> what is that? Well, the current conspiracy theory is that the government is um, planning to shut down all electronic um, everything, including banks, and there's not going to be any more money. And so there are a lot of people in very conservative cells who ordinarily wouldn't be focused on um, growing their own food that are starting to hoard seeds, like because there's a thought process that seeds are gonna become the new currency because people are gonna have to grow their own food and people learning how to grow their own food for when the apocalypse comes. So um, that is <laughs> something, it's, it's gonna be like an accidental reversion back uh, to the way we always lived, but still from a capitalistic perspective, because right now people are going out and buying seeds and buying soil and buying, buying, buying and spending their money um, until this uh, Do they know how to apocalypse. nurture the plant? Do they know how to nurture the plant and have the plant produce the fruit that's needed? No. And even like the way our society is set up right now with not even knowing the seasons. So like when I was growing up, I would ask my mom, can we go get some strawberries? And she would tell me strawberries are not in season. So they weren't in the grocery store. Well, now strawberries are in the grocery store all year round. And they're and so nasty. They're yes, they're they are, season. Sabrina. They are. They are nasty. <laughs> okay, yes, so we and have one hard, minute. All of that. I was going to share a little, actually, I was planning on talking about um, generational differences, but I can do that uh, another time. I think this conversation was amazing. Thank you so much, Ryan, for sharing um, your expertise and your passion. And um, I hope that in future Elevate meetings, the rest of us, you know, get our chance to talk about the things that, you know, make our hearts smile. <laughs> All right, go play ball, Ryan. <laughs> Thank See you, you later, Frank. Ryan. Find a way to ship me some food. I will. I will. Honey, don't you worry. I'm Thank working you. on it. I'm working okay. on it. I'll come okay. to New Hampshire and get it, Frank. All right. Yes. <laughs>
All right. Thank, Thank you, everybody. Bye. I also want to, also want to say Great instead, host, of, Sandra. instead of a diet, Frank, you can say you can call it a live it, you know? Well, I, I actually do. When I talk about it, I call it a lifestyle. Mediterranean, mm -hmm. I don't call it a diet. It's just most people mm -hmm. don't understand that. What I'd yeah. love to do, Ryan, is when you're ready, let's set up on a phone call and see how we can get something out there on this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Sounds good to me. Cool. So uh, I'll shoot you an email. You, and then we'll go from there. All right. Take care, guys. All right. Bye. Bye.